Assalamu alaikum, everyone. This is Hannah Zuberi. I'm the editor in chief of Muslim Matters. Uh, welcome to our Facebook Live. Um, this idea of having a chat about cuties was totally uh, our moderator, Om Jawairia. Uh, Om Jawairia is an author and she's the founder of Muslim Girls Read. Uh, Muslim Girls Read. Um, and she, uh, the panel will be consisting of um, film producer and um, uh, writer, Nia Malika Dixon. And Nia is going to be telling her about, us about uh, a film festival that she has been organizing. Um, and our other um, panelist today is Henna Ansari. Thank you, Henna, for being here. Um, Henna is a uh, author as well, and uh, she'll be sharing her book that she's that has been published. Um, and so I'm going to hand it over now. I mean, this. Uh, movie has been trending everywhere from Saudi Arabia to Pakistan to the United States. It's on Netflix. And normally we don't do a lot of discussion about these topics. Um, but um, this movie, um, that when since the movie poster came out and then the trailer came out, um, it has sparked a discussion across every as you know, every um, corner of the Muslim community, especially Muslim Twitter. And so we mm. wanted to, um, mothers groups are talking about it, masjid groups are talking about it. Uh, and this is something that has um, affected many of us. I know uh, for myself, my daughter and um, my daughters and um, uh, her, her friends have been writing about it um, and talking about it. and. Uh, this is, and as a mother, it was very important for me to hear the perspectives of especially uh, Black women, um, but mothers, and then writers and creatives. So we're really pleased to host this, and I'm going to hand it over to Om um, Jawiria. Uh, Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Thank you for having me here, Muslim Matters. And I just want to really give a shout out to Nia Malika Dixon, because actually this was her idea. This was her baby. Um, she was on social media saying, we got to talk about this. We really got to get together as Muslim women, as writers, as, as artists, and discuss this film because there's a, it's heavy. You know, there's a lot um, in the narration to unpack. And so I reached out to Nia and I said, well, let's get to it. You know, let's, let's put a panel together, inshallah. And uh, definitely a shout out to MuslimMatters.org and Hina Zubari for uh, giving us this platform to bring this discussion because it has been really heavy um, all over Muslim Twitter world, uh, Facebook, Instagram, everyone is talking about this, but even more than that, I, I see this discussion coming up in um, the non-Muslim world, like, you know, in my writers group, non-Muslim writers groups, in the parenting groups, as uh, Hina has said in address, um, I see the Muslim youth talking about it, but I also see my, my non-Muslim students talking about this film and their parents talking about this film. It's, it's such a awakening and it was very um, uncomfortable, it was an uncomfortable watch, I think, for many people because there was a um, petition to get it off Netflix and to cancel Netflix. That was the whole thing. Cancel Netflix, get it off of Netflix, cancel the writer, cancel the director. So this has really caused a rippling effect in different um, socioeconomic groups from Black Muslims and non-Black Muslims to uh, white, brown, everybody is talking about this film. So it is befitting for us as Muslims because um, Islam was front and center um, in this film. Like that was the first scene. Um, and so I, I really felt strongly that uh, we needed to come together as Muslim women, especially as Muslim women um, to reclaim our narrative and to unpack what we saw along with the rest of the world. 
So we're going to get right into it tonight, inshallah. And we have a great panel of writers and artists with us tonight, inshallah, to discuss this film. Um, as Muslims and as artists, we are always wanting to showcase authentic narratives, depictions, and art from our culture, our deen. But what happens when art mixes with pop culture and social media? Cuties is one of those representations that showcases complex, harsh, problematic, but realistic images for a coming of age story and for a new writer and director who in this case happens to be Muslim. So first I wanna go around and, and get first reactions because this movie um, as I just said, was complex and it was harsh. Um, it was problematic. And then, you know, at the end, there was just some a sliver, a, a shining of, of some hope. But the reactions have been so strong across this world. So I really want to hear what you all um, have to say about your reactions to this, this film. Mia, I'll start with you, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Well, I mean, you said it. I, I watched the film and I, I had a visceral reaction and I, and I spoke up about it because it's very complex on so many layers. Um, my point of view is coming from a black girl, is coming from um, a survivor of childhood sexual trauma, mm -hmm. is coming from a storyteller. My my perspective is coming from so many different lenses. It's, it's being perceived through so many different lenses. And in fact, that is what we have, a piece of art that was created through various lenses. Because even though a film is a story created by the, the writer director, it's also an orchestral piece of art. It is not something that's done solo. So the first thing I wanna say is kudos for getting this film made in the first place because anytime a film that is written and directed by a black woman, let alone a Muslim black woman gets mm. made, that's like a blessing, that's a miracle. Amen. That's something to be celebrated. Um, because first of all, she's given the opportunity to express her own narrative. She's in charge of it to a certain extent, you know, because, you know, we're funded and we hire people and we have cast and crew and believe it or not, the writer director is not the last person to sign off on a project as big as this. Um, but personally, I was offended by Netflix, because being a person in the film industry, I understand how things are done. And her, what we call P&A, print and advertisement for her project, it was, it was horribly done. It was horribly done. And it was not created with her in mind. And speaking from my perspective as a black Muslim filmmaker, that story, the way that it was marketed was not marketed to black Muslim people. And that's my opinion. And, mm -hmm. and I stand by it because looking at that poster, I was offended. Mm -hmm. I was really offended. And the only reason why I watched the film is because it was created by a black Muslim woman and it was her story that she wrote and she directed it. And like I said, you know, to start off, this is a feat. It's a blessing. It's like a miracle for a black Muslim woman to create a feature film. Um, that being said, you know, it was difficult to watch the film. It was mm -hmm. complex. It was very much a very personal story. I could tell from the beginning to the end, it was a very personal story. Um, as a writer and director myself, there were several choices that she made that I personally wouldn't have made, but that's because I'm not her. Um, and also, I know that her cinematographer was not a black Muslim woman. Um, he was a white male, I believe. And when you have a cinematographer partnered up with a director, it's very easy for that person, their perspective to come into play. Because 
we're seeing shots through his camera. We're seeing these images through his lens, even though she's directing. It's a symbiotic relationship, the, the, the cinematographer and the director. So it's very complicated. And I just wanted to say that because I'm offended at the way that she was treated. You know, this is a black Muslim woman who was given death threats and told, you know, so many horrible things that I don't even wish to repeat. And that hurt me as a, as a person, as a black Muslim woman, that really hurt me um, because I could feel all the anger and the ire that, you know, was directed at her. And it's, it was unfortunate. And yeah. I mean, now those are really some good points um, that you brought up and, and we'll try to dig into them um, a little bit later, just about the film industry, because a lot of people don't understand what goes on in the industry. Um, myself working in, in the publishing industry for the last 15 years and now moving very slowly um, into the film industry and, and, and writing in that um, space is, is very different. It's a very different world. But even in the publishing world, there are just are decisions that you don't get to make once you sign off on something as the writer. And exactly. I don't think that we in the Muslim community understand that. And some people say, well, you know, then you shouldn't do that. But, you know, this is her passion. This is her, her art. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's very complex. It's very complex. But I'm going to go on to Sister Henna and you can give us your, your first reactions as well. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, everybody. I hope everyone's doing okay in the pandemic. Um, staying safe at home, inshallah. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I don't want to be spotlighted on my own camera and stare at myself. Um, uh, I watched it yesterday afternoon and uh, it made me very uncomfortable, but I think in a good way. I like to watch movies that make me think and make me feel outside of my own you know, normal box. I'm an Indian Muslim, so the Senegalese part of the story I didn't understand so that I was like, oh, that's interesting that they do things that way or they do things this way. And I really loved the older auntie who kept coming over making her cut the onions. I thought that was awesome. I'm like, I've been there, my friend. But uh, I mean, I, I thought that the story arc for the Amy character was actually really delicately done. And I thought that people are really overblown with their you know disposition about this movie if they give it a chance, like all of us have, then you'll see that it's not this horror show that I have friends who are white who are boycotting it and canceling their Netflix and I'm like what are you doing just watch the movie and I posted that I found a really great article on the Washington Post today that talked about it and they were saying the same thing that uh, Neo was saying that it's not a detriment it's a great thing to see these stories they need to be told you know I'm a Muslim author and getting my story published was next to impossible because the literary community says they want these voices, but they don't. They wanna see it through their lens. They wanna see mm. you trying to overcome your religion, which I thought was interesting with the Amy Carey character. I didn't see her trying to overcome her religion so much as the cultural impact on her. I didn't mm. think it was Islam that she was bucking. I mean, yes, some of the scantily clad outfits I also would not wear, but that's because I've gained a lot of weight and I just wouldn't you know, be able to pull it off. But that was my initial reaction. I don't know if that's uh, too much or not enough. Um, I think those are, are good points. And, and again, going back to the industry and what the industry does um, and how hard it, they make it for Muslim, Muslims at all, regardless of your religiosity, um, your level of practice, uh, being an, uh, a racial minority, being a Muslim, those are actually strikes against you. So it, it definitely makes it difficult. Um, I know that the, the producer, the writer and the director, she actually submitted this film to a film festival, which was a Sundance Film Festival where she won and then Netflix picked it up. So again, she, she definitely had to jump through a lot of um, hoops to get this movie on Netflix. I'm gonna explain my initial reactions to the, the movie because I do disagree a little bit with the both of you. Coming from more of an Islamic standpoint um, and, and not so much of the story because I, I definitely champion artists' rights to deal with complex issues. 
And I did give it a chance because, you know, this is a Muslim sister and she's a writer and she wants, and I know how hard it is to get um, your work seen, read, you know, mm. but what I, so I wanted to see it for myself. I wanted to see the beginning, the middle, the end, and be able to pull back those layers on that narrative and see what was there. And so I saw the story. I saw what she was trying to do, right? There is, as an, a writer, you have an intention, right? The, the, the reason, the purpose in your mind, right? From the beginning of what you're trying to showcase, right? So I, I got the, the bones of her story. And I would, will say, um, as an educator who deals with, uh, I, I teach ESL, which is English as a second language. I'm also a reading specialist. Um, so I deal a lot with struggling readers, which often happens to be immigrants, um, sometimes Muslims, immigrant Muslims, but anybody who are second language learners coming into middle school, coming into high school, middle school and high school is definitely, we all know, it's not the best time. <laughs> and, you know, when you're 35, you're like, oh, high school was great because you're paying bills, but it wasn't great for most children. <laughs> you know, it was hard. It was awkward. You want to fit in. And as a Muslim, when you don't fit in, it weighs even heavier on you because you know coming into this space that where can you go? Who are you going to fit in? And unfortunately for many Muslim children in middle school, in middle school, sometimes even in elementary school, it starts for our children. They have this, this, this overwhelmingly um, lack of acceptance. You know, you feel isolated. You don't know where you belong. So I got that loud and clear from Aminata. You know, we learned that her name at the end of the film was Aminata, um, and they call her Amy for short. But um, I will say that the execution, and that's not all the writer's fault, but the execution of this, this film, right? The opening scene with the halaqa, you know, with her mother bringing her to the halaqa, you know, and them sitting in there and, and Amy being unaware of what's happening. That was very jarring to me because by middle school, this girl is coming into France from Senegal. And Senegal, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, this is a hub of Islam for Black Muslims, for Africans. So I reject that. I reject that 11-year-old from Senegal who just moved to France, doesn't understand what's happening during the halakha. To me, that's, that's unrealistic. Yeah, but that's her experience in the story, though. Mm. That's a, that's the experience in Africa, that she though. I, I've lived yeah, in Africa, and I feel like that, that who made that decision? Who made that decision? Maybe who that's her that? own personal experience. Everybody's experience. It could is be. It could be. But I, I question different. it. I question it because I've lived in Africa. I've lived in, in in many Muslim countries, and I just don't see it. I mean, even the child, the families who are not that religious like subhanallah i've seen children on the streets who know more ayat than me in africa you know what i mean so i don't think that's a fair assessment though like i okay. in a very religious household like you know studied islam memorized the quran and that time period it doesn't matter whether or not you clearly understand islam or your place in the muslim world or your community all that matters is that you are confused and you're young mm. and you don't understand your place in the world. Exactly. Like how can you mm -hmm. dissect and that? I, I definitely, and I accept that. I accept her being, because that's what I said at the beginning. I accept that. But I'm talking about that opening scene where she was just really discombobulated by being in a halakha. And I was just saying that her being she fresh... Says. I think she was discombobulated by being the youngest person there, which is like very much what happens. I agree. When sure. your like family, you know, tries to not, I wouldn't say enforce, right? They're trying to invite you to what you yeah. understand as what is good for you as a young right. girl. But your friends are going out, they're going to the park, they're having fun. You but would she have known what it is? It made it seem, it came off to me like she didn't know anything about Islam. Like this is a That's not Islam. the way I, I interpreted that. No. And that she just didn't get, she just was completely out of place amongst no. Muslims. She was, that was a different, comfortable. Then that she was a different way that you received it because oh, I, 
I received it the, the way that um, Najma just, I mean, I was 11 once, I was taken to Holocaust and mm -hmm. I'd, I'd be sitting there thinking, why am I sitting here? Like, I'd rather go out and hang out with my friends. This oh, is absolutely, boring. absolutely. Like, but my and, point was that opening scene to me kind of set the tone of she's not, she doesn't have a footing. She doesn't have a place. She's mm -hmm. not accepted here and she's not accepted there. That's no. the other thing that yeah, comes I up for me is the lack of conversations that she has. Like nobody communicates with her. And right. I, I resonated with that because, you know, I was the same little girl. Everybody expected certain things of you, but they didn't communicate clearly to you. And that's what the, the through line was for Ami that I saw. She was, she was an adult. She had to take care of her siblings. She had to do this. She had to do that. And all she wanted to do was be a kid and, and fit in in this new place that she moved to where she has no friends. And then she all of a sudden finds out that her father has betrayed her. Oh my God, the drama. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go back to that. Let's, <laughs> let's pull it back. Let's go back a little bit and let's pull it back. Because I think that's also some of the layering that I thought was questionable with the execution. Now we have a story, we, we know how that is, part is. That was well done that though. Was. That story was well presented. Was, right, those were the layers. Those were the layers. And I'm talking about the execution of, and the framing. Let's talk about framing now, because we have a story, but the way you frame a story, right? And so going back to that beginning of the scene where I felt that it was very clear that this little girl didn't have a footing in the space with her own mother. That's what I got from it. Like she was, an, she didn't understand what was happening here and she didn't understand what was happening in that new space. But, and for, you know, she was more inclined because she's a child to be with the girls, the young girls. She wanted to be a part of the cuties crew and she wanted, she liked them. She thought they were cool. She thought they were, um, you know, exciting. They were bold. They were getting in a little bit of trouble and that's what middle school girls do. That's what they do and that's that time they were dancing and little middle school girls, Muslim girls, they dance in their room. Whether they have music or not, whether their parents allow them to listen to music or not, you know your children will do some type of silly dance in your home. That's what little girls do. So that was very realistic to me and the awkwardness that she was feeling, but the framing of Islam as unrelatable to her, whereas the everything else, everything else was relatable to her. And then the layering, okay, her mother's going through um, difficulties in her marriage. Her mother is, her father is not there. That's another, you know, suggestion that, uh, you know, how Hollywood loves to put out just about black families anyway. The father is absent, he's never around. You know, the mother is doing everything. She's overworked, she's sad, she's depressed. So everything falls onto the child. Never where we see in white families where, you know, Ashley goes and picks up her brother Bobby from the, the bus station. And that's great. Ashley is learning how to be responsible. But when Aminata goes and watches her brother, it's framed in a way where she's overworked. She's over responsible. Whereas in every part of the world, once you get, you know, 10, 11, 12 in every household, mothers and fathers will give you more responsibilities. But in this, in this narrative, it felt very heavy, like they were just adding more and more and more to say like, okay, from the beginning, this is Islam. And this is why it's so heavy on her. And this is why, looking at the arc, you know, of this story, and this is why, she's being pushed to be free. That's not the way I interpreted that. I'm sorry. I'm Same, like, I, I totally get like, you know, understanding the arc of the story and the burden of this kid, right? Who has all these responsibilities that, you know, maybe a lot of kids around her age also have, but I only understood that burden through her lens of, trying to be like these group of girls who had their friend group who had their fun because the girl that she is trying to mimic and imitate also has responsibility she's doing right. injury, you know right but 
she has the ability to wear what she wants and she's dancing and she's having fun. And I think that's where it becomes very heavy is that she doesn't have the same freedom as this girl. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, like you see her literally like try to iron her yeah. hair, you know, like <laughs> yeah. she is dealing with so many layers of her like, femininity and feminine expression whereas her identity. Her has this like long straight hair she gets to dance she gets to do what she wants she has these responsibilities cool but then she gets to go dance with her friends and wear what she wants like I'm in a I mean not to didn't have the same right right why but does there's that, that other, I'm gonna I'd like to want to jump in okay. yes um, we were asking for first impressions and you know, I think we've gotten really deep into the story already. But my first impression, again, I mean, I guess a lot of it was shaded by the, the poster and by the conversation of, about it beforehand. But when do Muslim girls just get to be Muslim girls? Why is the not, okay, if the story was, why is it always framed around what they're wearing and what they're, how, and in, in, in this story, it was like, we have to be worse than even the non-believers. And we have to be the worst. We even get shunned by the non-believers in our extreme of doing things that are not acceptable to society. And that is what was I felt was extremely Islamophobic. Even I don't care uh, that it is made by a Muslim woman. We have internalized Islamophobia. That is a phenomena. It occurs everywhere. And this, I felt like this was an expression of that uh, in many ways as a viewer, as somebody who was watching this, um, it, that and then the, the big uh, elephant in the room, the dancing, why, uh, you know, the, just the, and I understand that the camera angles and everything are not uh, are controlled by the writer or the director, but as I'm, I'm talking about it as a viewer, um, if I'm in a movie theater or my room and I'm watching it, it, it was disgusting. I'm sorry, there's no other word. I was so turned off and so like grossed out because this is a little girl and this, you know, her, it, that, that was my first did reaction. Did you watch Jin with Nicola um, Mutman? We'll get to that later when we talk about other creatives and their work, and, and we'll definitely get to that. I want to keep the conversation, conversation, so hold that one. Yeah. Well, what I was going to say was, it's like, I what I was going to say is I was going to affirm her because a lot of, even Hala, like it, and it just centers our bodies and what we do with our bodies like a lot of coming of age muslim stories center dancing it centers hijab it centers what you wear what you don't wear and i think that's a larger issue mm-hmm. around how we create like you know coming of age muslim stories versus you know like honing in on this particular story and nitpicking which is very easy to do when you talk about like the directorial choices of zooming in on these young girls bodies which mm. like you know it just makes it very extreme and it's it's unfortunate that this is how this was shot and i think if it was shot differently we would have had a whole different conversation yeah, but yeah um, i agree yeah, yeah like that's, I that's 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 and i'd like to hear execution. Um, um, Jory, i know there are uh, two youth uh, on the line as well if we could perhaps get their um input as well Yes, um, maybe Muslim does. you jump in. <laughs> it's um, Zahra or Rueda, you want to jump in? I know you guys were, you're muted. <laughs> you're muted. <laughs> there you go. We can't hear you. No, we can't hear you. <laughs> no, we still can't hear you. You're unmuted, but we still can't hear you. 
Zara, you want to go? Okay. Uh, hi. So um, I think a lot of people want like Gen Z's perspective because I've seen even some of my favorite YouTubers have made that aren't Muslim or whatever made made a commentary videos on this movie and uh, me watching it myself. The thing is, um, I think a lot of people, a lot of black girls were looking forward to a coming of age featuring a Muslim black girl. And the first time that we do ever get one, it's overshadowed by, you know, distribution of child exploitation on film. And that's kind of disappointing because even if they didn't include that, I think this would have been an interesting story to be able to talk about. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us kids that are practicing in in America, we don't relate to any of the narratives and the portrayals of hijabis and Muslim girls shown on film. I don't, I've never related to any Muslim character that's ever been portrayed in TV shows and and movies like Hala, Rami, all those, all those shows. And I've noticed that they're all written by the same, like they're written by the same people. And yes, this is a different director, but it's, it's almost as if like Netflix never writes like an, a show about Muslims that like any of us can really, really relate to if you're, yes, I think b different people go through different struggles, but it's almost as if like, it's never, it's never about a story where a girl stays like, it's never like normal. It's it, on either extreme, right? It's either mm -hmm. showing that we're super oppressed by our parents mm. and that we're not able to yes. do anything. Or it's like, we need to like take off all our clothes in order to feel some sort of expression or freedom. And even mm. non-Muslims disagree with that. They don't, you don't have to take off all your clothes in order to feel some sort of freedom. I feel like I can be liberated while wearing my hijab and do all the stuff other normal girls do. And I you think- You're normal. Yeah, and I think another <laughs> thing, why I feel like these movies are kind of Islamophobic, right? Is because it's showing that like, if, if a girl does this, right, we're gonna go to some extreme and like take them to the masjid and and like do some sort of exorcism on them and that they're mm. not normal or that you know I, I know that France is a very Islamophobic country right and so seeing this is yeah. gonna kind of reinforce those negative stereotypes that the country's already portraying right they're banning hijab they're banning niqab like so it's just like why can't we ever get a normal Muslim girl who doesn't take off her hijab or needs like a white boy to save her. I just, I don't get this narrative that's always portrayed in films, so yeah. Can I answer that Yeah. real quick? I think that a lot of very religious Muslims, as long as like I've known and the communities I've been in, mm -hmm. they, <clears throat> this is a more like what people would call in media, like a Muslim secular endeavor. Creatives, are no longer like creatives are never the like religious Muslims. They're always the Muslims that teeter a lot of questionable lines or have had mm -hmm. a lot of um it's just it's hard to explain, but like really what it is is that a lot of the Muslims that want to see themselves seen won't see themselves in these spaces because they won't feel comfortable in these spaces and that like their communities won't accept them for being in these spaces. There is no support behind it. So mm -hmm. in order to get the kind of quote unquote representation people need, there has to be like, you know, an understanding as like producing cinema and creative work and writing and art as not like it's, it's supposed to be, it can be a religious act. And if we don't understand it as that, then we discourage a lot of people from producing the things that would make them comfortable viewing. <clears throat> interesting thank you I'm gonna, I, oh, I agree wait, with what you're saying I do and I want to add to that that as a creative person as a writer I don't see myself reflected in any film and tv ever either and mm. I'm about to turn 46 mm. and I've been doing this for a while and um 
I don't knock other people's stories though, because everybody's experience is different. Everybody's experience with their creator is different. And I don't assume anything about somebody's relationship with Islam or whatever through their storytelling, because that's really all it is, is storytelling. However, at the same time, I do want to reiterate that if we don't allow people to creatively express themselves without judgment, without being attacked, then we won't get these stories that we're seeking that we want to see. You know, I grew up, my mom made me read the Quran every Ramadan. So I grew up in a very quote unquote religious family, but people look at me and assume otherwise, just because I don't wear my scarf, because I don't believe that you have to wear your scarf. That's my opinion you know and i should be allowed to have that opinion because on the day of judgment i have the answer to allah for that um but at the same time we don't make space for that for people we're always always jumping down people's throats oh this wasn't done right and that wasn't done right well life is messy you know nothing is ever perfect so um i just wanted to say that to give some breathing room to these creative people so that they feel safe we're going to go to that, but I'm going to come back to Rueda. Are you ready to speak now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, alhamdulillah. Um, so we're asking for first impressions. Yeah, just your reaction to what you saw. Um, so personally, I haven't watched it. Um, I don't feel comfortable watching it, um, but I have watched a lot of video essays about it and read some articles, and I got the basic idea and stuff, and... Um, I mean, like everyone else, I was very shocked um, how I feel like to spread awareness about something, you don't really have to, um, like me and Zahra were talking about earlier between ourselves, this is like a glamorized version of like the problem at hand. If, if you want to fix a problem and you want to use cinema and art to do so, I feel like um, if you use a problem in your work, I don't know, it's kind of like counterintuitive, um, but that's my take um, on it. I do understand other people believe it's like art and like a movie should be um, allowed to um, kind of say whatever it needs to say or, but I feel like at the same time, Muslim women who feel inaccurate, inaccurately represented um, should um, be valid in their critique and their criticism because we're growing in an age where media is very influential. And for people who don't get to meet Muslim women and feel as if we all feel a certain type of way, and I'm keeping in mind, of course, that all people have different experiences in life, but you kind of see this similar repetitive narrative. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if we're not gonna have any, any type of variety, like a normal Muslim girl, like how people, um, like how Zahra and other people had said in the Zoom call that just a regular Muslim girl living her life. Um, I feel like people, if it's not about a stereotypical Muslim, people don't know what else it can be about. Just like how mm -hmm. a lot of people have been commenting on Hollywood, how um, colorism really exists and we don't get a lot of dark skin representation. And I feel like it's similar to that, how representation doesn't really you don't have to have the same narrative to feel represented like I would like to see a normal regular dark-skinned girl um, protagonist in a like an everyday show just like how I would have to, I would love to see a normal everyday Muslim in an everyday show without this hijabi trope this oppressive narrative it's it's really off-putting mm -hmm someone who's young and trying to seek representation um it's really off-putting and that that's that's how i feel about it and for example um we see how media does affect so much how people do perceive us so if they never have seen a muslim and the only time they do see it or they've never seen a hijabi and the only time they do see it is on movies it does trickle down into conversation when you do go to college and you do go out and see these people who've never met, met a Muslim, they're gonna be asking you these questions that are kind of infuriating because <laughs> they saw this one narrative. It's, it's, it's and I've 
that it's the one narrative that sells in Hollywood. And mm -hmm. oftentimes creative directors do film, like they do narrate it. They, they kind of mesh it, although they might include their own stories in it. And I respect every, every person who has a different narrative, but sometimes they do kind of mold it around the thing that will sell. And oftentimes yeah. that, so much that selling point, mm -hmm. yeah, that selling point does harm us more than it does good. Well, my question is, why isn't Ami a normal Muslim girl then? I thought she was a normal Muslim girl. I didn't think she was out of the ordinary. We don't see her pray, do we? Oh, we don't really why, see her. Why do we need to see her pray in order to know that she prays, though? Like, these are like assumptions. Because we don't see Muslim making. on TV pray. Unless yeah. they're being oh, they're being forced to do it, and that goes so, back to the the, the so, tropes that so only she's a normal her girl pray that, makes her a normal Muslim girl. Seeing her pray no, no, is the no. only way that no. she's a normal Muslim girl. No, but I think it no. would help that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, sister. No, no, go. <laughs> no, I was going to say it would help for representation purposes to see like, oh, I pray five times a day. Oh, the person on TV is praying yeah. too. But that's like, there not was her a story, though. That's her yeah. making up something then. Like we are having this conversation about one particular story, making all these judgments based on what we want to see instead of experiencing this as someone else's story. And point. Talking about like stories that sell instead of talking about stories that get funded, which is the real issue. There is an mm -hmm. abundance of Muslim stories that still just need money. Like, that's our main issue. Like, of course, a certain story will sell and you'll be able to pitch it, but like, you'll be able to pitch it, you'll be able to sell it, but like, who's it's gonna- It's really not that simple though. It's, it's really not, not that simple. simple. <laughs> like, yeah, because, because, because we don't control those spaces and we don't have the capital to support each other. And exactly. we don't even have the, we don't even have the sisterhood or the brotherhood to support right. each other either. So that's right. a, that's a whole nother conversation. Right. And I think um, Najma and, and, and Mia, you have brought up some really valid points. It is her story. And you know, we're here with our reactions. We're only on the first question um, with our reactions, but you know, it's just like, you know, as, watching it and I like I said I got the bones of the story and I thought it was juicy enough without all of the other stuff she had a great storyline I just felt like the layering and the framing of the story kind of bent swayed into an angle that we already seen in Hollywood we always see it in the media I mean, she had a great story of a coming of age of a girl struggling in middle school, dancing. All of that is realistic to me. I see it every day um, as a middle school teacher. I know what my middle schoolers go through. Um, I know what high schoolers go through. I know they're, you know, they tick tock in every five minutes. Ugh, I deal with that, <laughs> you know, every five minutes, even on the remote line, they are tick tocking every five minutes. But, you know, it was just, it, I think uh, uh, Hina brought up an excellent point in that there was one point in the movie where she went so far, she went so far to the left, the non-Muslim girl had to check her. Like, uh-uh, we don't do, she actually said, we don't do that. And then one of her other friends said, if I would have did what you did, my parents would have put me back on the plane to Nigeria. Like, so now what they elevated was that the other girls who don't have, didn't come from a Muslim family, didn't come from a rich Islamic Senegal, rich, rich, rich Islamic history in Senegal, that she now is the, the lower in morality and ethics. She has no boundaries. And that no, that's, that's not what I... That's not what I received from, from that. I received that, they didn't that want her she to be just didn't know what the heck she was doing. That's they she was out so for her behavior. I totally the way that like, I have definitely seen that happen in middle school, especially middle school where like the girls don't know where to toe the line and they do something really crazy. And then all of a sudden, she has sudden, no idea they're talking she's, about her. Right. She's well, wild and out because she has no idea what the boundary is. She's never been in that world before. What I understood from that 
from the girl saying that their parents would have punished them. And the, what I liked that Maimuna did was that her Muslim parents didn't punish her. I mean, they I had a the very good. strange scene with the exorcism. Yeah, that was really strange. What I liked was that she wasn't punished in the way that you would expect her to be punished after everything was layered on and on and on. And you kind of assumed as a viewer that she would be punished in the manner that her friends reacted. Like the only people who truly punished her are herself and her friends that she kept trying to join. It wasn't really her, like her mother didn't kick her out towards the end. Her mother was like, if you want to attend the wedding, you don't have to. She kind of like, you know, into mother's intuition that she was going through it and she didn't feel comfortable with this marriage and all that. And I think that was a very good thing to highlight. Like she turned to Islam to try to heal her daughter, even though that scene, obviously we agree that was so, so weird. But I think that that was a very important thing to highlight for like Muslim parents and kids. Can we dive into that scene? Because I think that really for Muslims was what they felt was very Islamophobic. Um, the twerking while the Quran was playing. I, it just didn't need to be there. And I, 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 I do, I would have expected a little bit um, more from the writer. Like, was that scene necessary? I mean, they could have still did that scene, which I don't know Islamically where it came from, like culturally or Islamically. I've never heard of that practice. So if anybody wants to chime in, is that a Singhalese situation? But I've, I know Singhalese Muslims and I, I've never heard of that particular, um, you know, practice. But, you know, throwing water on someone, it seemed very actually Christian based, you know, like some type of holy water situation. Okay. Um, actually, actually, yeah, I have. We know family friends who are exorcists Islamically. It's that exorcists is like throwing the water. Yeah, yeah, there is some part of the pulling of the evil spirit. You trap it in the water and then you release it. They asked me if I wanted to go to the exorcism and I was like, no, no, I do not want to go with you. Thank you for that invitation. Okay. <laughs> but I, just wanted to like know but I think the twerking at that point, you, you jump in, Atia. Yeah, it, that piece, what I took it as was they were performing Rukia of, of her. Rukia, yeah. And the, 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 the twerking and such was her her fight between good and evil because even at the end mm. when they were dancing on stage it finally hit her like this is not my life and yes. that's when she stopped and that part I think for me I can relate to the whole movie all of it and I think we're looking at it in a judgmental take we're we're ripping it apart and not seeing yep. it for what it is in exactly. the sense of a young girl coming of age period be it Muslim or non-Muslim. Because if you look at social media, if you've ever been to a young um, football game with cheerleaders, what they're doing, the, the costumes and everything is just exactly what you saw on TV. Um, it's just the, you know, they hypersexualized it. But that coming of age, that trying to be a yeah. part of something, because she was a part of nothing. You know, she was exactly. the only girl. She moved into, you know, a new apartment. She thought she would finally get away from her little brother and no one talked to her. And that is a problem in the Muslim community. Yep. With parents and children. Mm. We don't yes. talk to our children. We talk at them. One of the mm -hmm. best things that my daughter told me as an adult, unfortunately, she said, Umi, you used to tell us what was wrong islamically you didn't tell us morally it was incorrect and i think that's one of the biggest things hmm. that we don't do with our muslim children we we give them islam but we don't break down the islam and society to say mm -hmm. that this is incorrect period even like you could see the innocence of them when the girl was blowing up a condom she yep. thought it was a she thought it was just a condom and she was the tough one and she was you know she was mean and, and everything to Amy when in actuality she was really soft because like she was hurt that they they uh, treated her that way mm -hmm. but that showed the innocence of them of their age and to understand child psychology at that age 10 11 years old your peers are everything your family mm -hmm. is nothing 
you know, you yep. go according to your peers. And here it is. The only peer that she could identify was them to the point that she took, she went home and learned all of these dances that was clear that she had never done before and had mm -hmm. never had access to until she stole a phone. Once she stole right. a phone, she had access to the world. And I look, and for me, that's how I look at it with the children now, our Muslim children. Any, everyone is delusional if you believe that Muslim children are not doing the same types of gyrating and such like right. that because 90% right. of them have an electronic device right. that yep. is not monitored 24 seven, you know? So that part is real in our community. And I think for me, I like the story. I didn't like the advertisement of it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a conversation that believe it or not, you should sit down with your young girls and mm -hmm. watch it together and dissect yeah. it and say, this is society. This is what, this is what we're trying to keep you away from. You know, I want to add to what you were saying, sister, because I want to point out that the brother said to the, the mother, you sh if you want to have yes. a conversation about your marriage, you should. And I think that's a really big thing that stood out for me because that mm. was a point of, to me, that was a plot point, you know, yes, as an audience member, you got to recognize you're not having conversations with your child. You're not having conversations about this marriage um, with yourself, honestly. So, you know, that to me was a big point where we should have a conversation about that. Yeah, she didn't and that was that was actually very pivotal because the only reason why she found out about the other woman was the fact of you know she was hiding underneath the bed and yep. that's, where yes. she, that's I believe that's where her respect for her mother went out the window yep exactly yeah, yeah, yeah for sure I was going to go to that next with the polygyny yeah you you know, she about had that. to actually digest and watch her mother this strong woman you know crumble to the point where she hung up the phone because she was emotionally a wreck. And I don't, I couldn't figure out who she was calling to tell about the marriage. Um, but that piece, and that's what made her, I believe that's what made her dislike her father at that point. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. you oh, just sure. destroyed my mother. I wanted to say uh, our first reactions, number one, were first reactions, right? So it's, uh, and then Obviously, if I'm having a visceral reaction to something, that's not fair to say it's judgmental. That's what you're asking me. What was my right. reaction? So that is, you're asking for a judgment call. Um, but it, having watched it, I will say that I would personally suggest that Muslim parents watch it. Because the fact that that there was, and, and because, and, and I, I do puber puberty workshops, I've done them across the country. Um, and this, this notion of not communicating, not talking, this whole notion of getting her period and, and her, you know, that whole, uh, we, we saw her, her looking at the blood and being out there and, uh, you know, the focus on, on that. It just showed me the, the lack of sexual education in our, in our communities, whether here or anywhere, whether we live in the West or the East. Um, and that is so important uh, Islamically, uh, from a societal perspective, from a health perspective, so in so many ways, uh, we shut down the conversation. Um, so number one, that that you know, it, it would be just like you were saying, um, Sister uh, Atia, that uh, a, it, it's a conversation point to have conversations with your children about this. The second thing was the use of and the impact of social media. Uh, being on these channels, TikTok, or on and and the likes and and doing things for performance on social media that you may never do in real life, and being judged on that by your peers, and how you know that one scene where she's uh, running to the 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 uh, place where they're doing their tryouts. And she has this look on her face like she is possessed, like she needs to be there and it, it, nothing else matters. And that is a very real, like imagine ourselves at 10, 11, like every, all those emotions are uh, high, heightened. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, it, you know, what we feel today, uh, even just anger and love and, or surprise, everything is not 
a, it's a quarter of what we felt at that age. Our emotions were just like hormones, everything. It's just, just a stronger you in that way. So that was something definitely, I think uh, I would like recommend, um, you know, to young moms, especially who have girls that age or have girls who are a little younger to watch it just so they would be able to see um, the world that their little girls are growing up in. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, I'm going to move on the conversation, inshallah, um, because I think we're going there anyway. And I think it's really important um, from a standpoint of discussing Muslim art and Muslim narratives. I, you know, I've read several articles, I've read tweets and, and reactions from some of our students of knowledge in America. Some imams have even chimed in and, and, and made some comments about this. Um, African Americans, you know, uh, different Arabs uh, have discussed it, and you know, in the Indo Pakistani community, Alhamdulillah, so we have a I've read a variety of reactions to it, and I, I know that there is what you know Nia is talking about that judgmental tone when people are judging what we call art, right? Because it's especially on the fiction side that this this is this is a story; it's not real. You know, she had an intention, whether she executed it um, fully or she met her own goals individually, um, or she, you know, caved into the pressure of the industry that she's in is a whole separate situation. So my question going forward is um, to move this conversation as Muslims is, is there a way to tell authentic stories about complex subjects regarding Muslims? Um, and to deal with the complex society and complex people. We are people. Allah says that, you know, the Prophet said that, um, that, you know, every, everyone will be tested, right? Everyone will be tested. Allah said that. And also that there, Allah said that, you know, that there's good in both. There's, there's weak believers, there's strong believers, and Allah loves them both, right? And everybody has their trials and their tests. Um, and so we, we know that this is a complex world. This dunya is completely complex. And so how do, do Muslim artists um, show the complexity of our community um, authentically, but with care? Mm -hmm. And I think that really is the issue here, with care, because there's that Islamophobia that we hate. We all hate. We don't want to be you know, stuffed into boxes and painted in, you know, derogatory ways. And we don't want Islam to be, um, uh, you know, misaligned. And it always is misaligned in the media, you know? So we're looking for us to be represented fully like uh, Ruweda and, and Zahra was saying, you know, we wanna see, you know, happy Muslims, <laughs> you know? We wanna see people enjoying life we want, and we, but we also know, as Nia was saying, and as Najma has pointed out, and as Atiyah was saying, that you know there are Muslims who are struggling, right? And their stories deserve to be told as well. So how do how what would be the advice to Muslim um, creatives and writers and directors and producers in showcasing that with kids as an, as an audience member? Whenever I view art, I view it through the lens as a human being. And I will suggest, this is just me speaking as a Muslim creative, that you view people's art as a human being. And I just feel like there's so much separation that Islam is the separate entity from us being human beings. Maybe that's my perception of what's going on, but um, it just feels like until we start to recognize that we are human beings and we are flawed and, and recognize that we will experience these things as human beings and stop trying to separate ourselves from our Islam, you know, Islam to me is your way of life, your deen, it's, it's how you do everything. I say bismillah before I do everything. I don't know what other people do, but that's just me and that's my Islam. And 
it comes through with everything I do, but I don't have to paint a picture of it. Like, mm -hmm. I don't have to show you my notebook where every page I start with this and that. I don't really need to show you that because I already know that's what I do. And the people around me already know that's what I do. And if, if I happen to make a movie about myself, you probably see a, a, a little sh insert of my notebook with Bismillah Rahman Rahim written in Arabic on it, you know? But to me, I think this separation of, oh, this is how Muslims should be painted, or this is what a typical Muslim or a normal Muslim, or this is a normal Muslim story. This is Islamic story. I think trying to separate Islam from the human being is, is what's getting us into trouble. Mm. <laughs> Hina? Uh, me or uh, the other Hina? Well, you're in front of her on my screen, so you can oh. go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I can't disagree with anything that Nia said. Um, I mean, from a creative perspective, when I tried to get my book published, um, it was difficult. I mean, there's no avenue, regardless of what kind of Muslim I was, nobody cared. I mean, they wanted, uh, like uh, Zahra and Rueda said, they wanted the oppressive story. And my story wasn't about oppression. I, I wrote a ghost story um, with an Islamic character in it. So it didn't have any oppression. And actually, the, the I don't want to tell you what happened in the end. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, I, I just say you just keep creating and hopefully you'll hit you'll hit the nail on the head at some point. I mean, I independently published my book and uh, you can get it on Amazon if you want. And it's a normal Muslim girl and she does her namaz occasionally in the book. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. All right. So the next Hina, Hina Z. <laughs> So I want to see, a you know, maybe the, what we mean by normal, where everything isn't sexualized or mm. things aren't some extreme, uh, where where's the story of a Muslim couple who are struggling with infertility or that's mm. that's a struggle. Uh, it, you know, where or, uh, you know, a young boy discovering something or like the hundreds of story of stories we see on um, uh, in Hollywood or on TV where they're innocuous, like little, like, oh, they, they met at a, at a bookstore and the, the whole book, the whole stories are revolving around that novel and, and their love for reading or something. Those are complex stories as well, mm -hmm. but they're not, they don't have to be some sort of exoticized extreme and that is what my struggle is with the stories that come out uh, and, and consistently come out about Muslims. Um, tell your stories, tell them authentically, tell, uh, have, you know, and, and, and sometimes it's very difficult, but are, is every Muslim story that deserves to be told, does it have to be some sort of extreme? There you go. Atiyah, you wanna jump in? You have anything? And anybody in the in the in the participants, I see a lot more of you who are who are out there. If you have a comment, um, we welcome you to join in, inshallah. Um, but I'll just go in through the participants that I can see. Oh, she didn't turn her microphone. Your your mic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there. That's how I go. So um, being. Being raised Muslim in the West for, you know, the past 48 years of being Muslim, I'm, I'm actually not okay with the inclusion that we're seeing now of Muslims, because mm -hmm. it's not a, it's not a true inclusion. It's more of a, all right, fine, we'll put you in because now you're trending, <laughs> you know, um, one of the great, and I, I don't know if you all have seen it, um, but the movie Muslim. Mm -hmm. I think that was an awesome. Again, that was a movie that I could relate with. I was that little black girl, you know, with her brother going to school, you know, felt, trying to fit in where I didn't fit in. I think those those things, those stories need to be told a lot more because we live in this fantasy world that our Muslim children are these perfect things and the world is not affecting us. The world mm -hmm. is affecting us more and more because every day, I know for me, every day I am seeing Muslim children 
and Muslim parents leaving Islam, leaving the Islam that they were brought up on, you know, where you go from one extreme to the next. And I don't think we have those true conversations about what happened. How did, how did this happen? How did you get to that stage that everything that you knew, everything that you were raised on Islamically, you're now at this stage that you just forget all of the things that, you know, you, the Islam that you had, you know, apostasy was something that was foreign, you know, 20, 30 years ago, but today it's common. We are, you know, Muslims are literally apostatizing and going, apostating and going to Christianity and becoming people in in the church and such like that. And we don't have those real in-depth conversations, be it in movies, books, or whatever the case may be. If we don't talk about it and we keep sweeping it underneath the rug, we're Mm going to continue to lose, you know, all of our children, you know, parents. I look at, I seen a sister yesterday and I don't know what kind of reaction she was um, looking. She was someone that you know, covered, knows Islam, this, and, you know, all of this. And she haunts me and I didn't recognize her. And then she's like, Salaam alaikum. And I was like, oh, okay. Why did you do <laughs> because I wasn't prepared there because I don't know, you don't know anyone's true relationship with the law, but you have a, a outward appearance of it. And my first thought is we got to talk. Because I want to know what happened. I'm not judging you, but what happened? What triggered you to to make this drastic change, especially because you're still raising children? And I Mm -hmm. think that's the piece that we fail to realize. And I bring it back to the kids because we're not having the true conversations with the kids. We're not giving them the right voice to talk about how does it feel to be in middle school when you want to tick tock and you want to wear the jeans and the belly shirts and you know my jean my granddaughter said to me she's like I was like what's going on with your jeans she was like what jeans how do they fit I said they do they really fit and she was like <laughs> it's okay. those lack of conversations that we're we're just not having and I mean, I grew up born and raised Muslim in Baltimore. I grew up and I went to Sister Clara Muhammad school. You know, I didn't go to public school until uh, middle school, eighth grade. And I, I resonated worse, with- but I'm going to leave that alone. Say it again. <laughs> I said, sometimes being raised in, uh, growing up in Muslim school, going only to Muslim school, sometimes it might be a little bit worse. Right, exactly. <laughs> so that. when I when I got to eighth grade, you know, I figured things out, but I was so blessed to have that foundation. You know, I grew up in a very strong community and that's what we don't have anymore. And I've been trying to recreate community for like the past 20 years of my life. It's really hard, you know? (laughs) It is hard. And that's where we need to start is that lack of community, those lack of conversations and, you know, the the difficult conversations that we're not having, these girls are having with each other. Mm -hmm. That was pretty good. Um, Moving on, did any of our youth wanna jump back in with any comments? Just wanna give them some space for their voices (laughs) and amplify them. I saw someone make this uh, point that, not in here, but like it was in a video, right? And they were like, Um, Gen Z, anyone who isn't Gen Z would, it's mostly people who aren't Gen Z who would disagree with this um, movie or like disagree with the, how how to explain it, like how this movie was executed because Gen Z goes through these issues and it's so normal for us that we would just be accepting of it. And I feel like you see, like with this, the, my only problem with this movie was the execution. It wasn't the storyline itself or, you know, the, the discovery or whatever, or like the self-discovery or the coming of it. That wasn't my problem because it was just, I think, I think why this became like, this is such a shocking movie to begin with was the you know, I, th- I just, I feel like it was the camera angles and the, you know. I mean, there was one scene when, where she just, the cam- you know, it wasn't even an angle. She just pulled her pants down and took a picture. 
Yeah. So that you can't even, I mean, to me, if you didn't have like a shocking um, and response the- to that as an adult or even as a child, like the that entire- was the moment where her friend said to her, like, that's too much. We don't do that. Now we dancing and we popping and locking, but we not taking <laughs> pictures, you know, <laughs> just not taking point. those type of pictures. It wasn't even about her being Muslim, right? I think this was more of like a, what made me really uncomfortable was the fact that they hired child actors to reenact this. And that's why Ted Cruz was sending this, like, like making a complaint about this. Like, yeah. Netflix. And that, that's another situation. That's another that's conversation. A, yeah, never conversation. Right there, boy, that's yeah, some Ted white Cruz supremacy right there. another thing to worry about. Yeah, indeed. And <laughs> then, I need my know, stimulus check. <laughs> <laughs> you know from a technical standpoint um there were a lot of technical choices that i personally would not have made but just know that when films are done there is a responsibility on everyone to protect mm-hmm. the people who are on set yeah. from the children all the way up to the adults there is a responsibility and Believe it or not, behind the scenes, there are laws and rules. So even though it's pretend and on screen, I'm, I can tell you as a filmmaker, there's no way that she actually took a picture of her vulva. Like, there's no way. Right. She would have been arrested for that. That's just, yeah. However, France, that the film was filmed in French and they have much more lax um, child labor laws and they have much more, they're much more open sexually and what is acceptable on the screens in France. But I don't know the particulars of what happened on that film, but I think that was really the scene that got sliced and put out there along with the marketing in in that particular flyer. But even with that marketing, that was a real scene in the movie. Yeah, It wasn't like something particularly different, but it was taken out of context. I get that too. You've got to recognize it's all pretend. You have right. to understand that. There are plenty <laughs> of films that are made. Like, think back to Jodie Foster. She played a 12 year old prostitute. You right. know, like, think about mm. all the films that are made and all the pretend that goes into it. And those behind the scenes, you never know what they're doing or how they're getting that shot off. You never know. You never know. But, but in the age of Me Too, we know that many actresses have been um, treated inappropriately on sets. That's a thing too. So we know that happens as well. We know that many child actors have been molested and and utilized in ways that they should not have been and they have not always been protected. So that's a real, real concern about film, the film industry because sometimes, a lot of times laws can get broken and children are not protected as they should be. But we're not saying that particularly happened on her set it's just that that can be a concern for people, especially in the age of Me Too, where we know that sexual violence is very real in the film industry. I, I, I wanted to say one positive thing. The imam wasn't some horrible, horrible person that was like, yay, right. and God, and <laughs> that trope didn't play out. Um, you know, uh, the mom, there was this point where the mother, the, the white mother was, oh, your mom's so sweet, but this mother is, uh, you know, not sweet and not available, but she redeems herself at the end. So that was like, yay, mom. But there was three, two things that I really wanted, to, like girls need to watch out for. Like friendship was like this theme throughout the movie. Yes. And what makes a friend, what is a friend, uh, what, the ethics of friendship. Mm. Uh, that was something that like just a discussion, again, discussion point with your girls is like, what you know who is a friend what is friendship what do you do for your friends like her stealing money from her mom and going you know uh, be seen as a muslim trait like buying stuff for friends is is very like part of a lot of our cultures but the stealing the money to do it and so that was um that was uh you know uh, important and an important point um but Aside from that one thing that really, like, I don't think we've touched on much over here is the normalization of pedophilia. I'm that the, uh, that scene in the laundromat where that young woman is dancing, the girl is dancing. She's a like baby, you know, 10 year old. They did look young. She's a 10 year old. Um, but 
you she t and you don't see anything except for the hair and you're assuming that this is going to be a short petite woman and then she turns around and that little baby face just broke my heart because I was just like and that was very like it, it you know uh, made you just go back and be like oh my god what is going on here um and then that scene and then then when she learn you know Ami herself learns to sort of sell her sexuality when she wants the phone back and that addiction to the phone which we see in a lot of young people um that mm. was also something they'll do anything for the phone I mean yeah I would do anything for the phone or, or mm. to the access to the outside world through that phone um those but I would want to hear more about this um the normalization of pedophilia in this movie aside from just the that we've talked about the angles and all of that um uh, that scene in the laser tag when that man is looking it's it's all on purpose. It's all on purpose to call attention to the fact that that's what's going on. If you pay attention to the judges faces, if you pay attention to the audience, there's right. one mother in particular that I was applauding where she turned mm. her daughter's face away and she was yes. looking disgusted. That is a purposeful direction that the director gave to those people to do. Everything you see on the screen is on purpose. So the, the reaction of the guard that was on purpose to show you that this is what these girls are facing out in the world. And honestly, I can say I've been through it. I've been through it. And I, and that's the one thing, unfortunately, that rang too true is that this is what's going on. And that I think is important to say that she called right. attention to that. And that's what I said. She had the storyline. The storyline was juicy enough. I just felt that there was some issues with the execution. And this being her first film, that's not uncommon. Um, however, the reaction, and I'll go back to that, the reaction from the Muslim world to this particular story, um, where I felt like it was very realistic, um, very, very realistic. Um, and like you said, so many Muslim children can relate to certain parts of this particular film. And for the Muslim community to be so um, ignorant to what young children are dealing with, especially, 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 especially little black girls. Yes, mm. who are in public schools. I mean, the public school world is not for the faint of heart. I work in the inner city. Okay, I, I work in the inner city, and and most of my students have experienced some form of trauma. Um, so I, I know that it's very real and I know that her story is relatable and I felt like the storyline was very believable. It's just that there were pieces of it I had to, as a writer and as someone who has seen different parts of things, like what was that decision based on? Just, and, and that's just nitpicking because like I said, first movies, um, you're going to make some mistakes. You're going to have some issues. You're going to have you're gonna doubt yourself, especially, you know, um, imposter syndrome. You're not gonna make all of the best decisions with the first film. And that's something that um, people outside of the industry have to understand that growth has to happen and things like that. And the sister has to have an opportunity to get her footing. But I think the storyline um, that she wrote was, was very intriguing and it, it was very much um, believable. Um, but I think that the conversation that we have to have as Muslims is that how do we deal and how do we interact with creatives who are trying to tell these authentic stories and trying to open their, um, the world's eyes to things that matter to them, especially when dealing with complex <laughs> issues. I keep going back to the complex issues because that's what I think it was so jarring to the community. Um, that she had, she put, she decided to put in such, as you said, dealing with ped pedophilia, dealing with over-sexualization of girls, um, dealing with, uh, and I'm, we, we haven't talked about it, the polygyny, which is also another, and I've actually thought, I went back and forth with, with it, but it is something in the Black Muslim community, whether we're talking about in the West, are we talking about in the East? 
whether you're in Africa or London or Philadelphia, you are going to see these families, black Muslim families and children dealing with this situation. And oftentimes that is where we see a break in the dynamics of the family, right? There is a breakdown there when polygyny comes into play. Uh, fathers are making decisions, mothers are making decisions, whether the father is marrying someone else or the mother is marrying into ta'adud, marrying into polygyny, that often is uh, a catalyst for um, shifting our families. And often it leads to a breakdown. I myself have seen with my own eyes and experienced other families where, you know, like Atia said, they were, you know, garbed one day and, you know, and in the massages one day and, and deaning one day, and then something happened, like polygyny happened, and that family fell apart. And so I, I thought that was interesting that she added that lift to support her claim, but I did feel like it was more layering. But it, it was a, a, I think it was a believable lift that this girl felt um, emboldened to make bad decisions because of the situation that her mother was in. The internalizing that pain and that hurt and quite frankly, the disgust that she had for her father because of the situation that he put her mother in. Anybody wanna to respond to that? I just threw it out there. <laughs> I mean, polygamy is, I mean, I've, I know people who've gotten married multiple times, men, and it's not unusual, but the fact that it comes back to what Nia said about communication, I think that if they had communicated that, that was even going to happen or that, you know, I don't know. It, I think it does stem back to communication because if she knew that, if she had learned Islam properly, then you know that that's something well, that- her mother, uh, didn't know. her mother just got a, a letter in the mail. <laughs> no, yeah. her mother knew. Yeah. No, she remember when they, when they moved to France, when they moved to their new apartment, because they moved into the new apartment and that back room, she said, you can't go in that room. That room is for something else. Right. So, so she, she knew got the that letter the and she said, well, he took another wife. And that right. was like, okay. But as a woman, you <laughs> kind of sort of know your mom's not coming to live with us. Who else is coming to live with you? You know, that kind of that would thing. Be a, that would be a shock to me. Yeah. But, you know, I think it, 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 it still boils down to, in my opinion, um, just the conversation and not having, she never had the conversation with her daughter, even no, to the point she, where yeah, she didn't yeah, address, she, she didn't address the fact that her daughter who loved her father, who was waiting for her father to come, he finally called and she wouldn't speak to him. And she mm. dropped the phone out the window. <laughs> and it was no conversation to that whatsoever. I like think she knew by then when she threw the phone out the window, she dropped the phone that she was mad about the situation. I think she picked yeah. up on it. But she didn't, but she didn't want to deal with it. She didn't have a conversation. And sometimes, yeah. I was saying, as parents, as mothers, we don't know how to have the conversation. Are we too hurt? We're not ready to have the conversation. And you get to places like that too. Like, I'm in my feelings. I'm hurt. I'm sad. And I got to get through this first before I can save you. And, and that's, that's the point of, of her woman. having that yeah. in the story. Right. That oh, was yeah, the whole sure. point. That yeah. was the yeah. whole point because that's her experience and it's all connected. Right. Um, I have one point to say about the pedophilia that you were talking about. Um, so based off other movies I've seen like Precious, uh, there were like, there were explorations that she was sexually abused and stuff like that. And there are movies like that that make a point about sexual like sexualization of kids without including it in their movie and so although you're saying that she's making a point I'd, I'd relate it to uh making a documentary of you hitting an animal in the name of animal abuse awareness mm. uh, see, your your content is still um pleasing to pedophiles who are watching this movie and so that's my I I can see how why a pedophile would really enjoy watching this movie and that's my only problem with, with it. I have a question. Did you watch the entire film? Yes, I watched the entire film. Like, what yeah. was your what was your feeling about Aminata at the end of the film? 
after her journey? I do, I do see, I just feel like they didn't have to film her in those positions. For her no, to I didn't, no, I don't want to know about that. I just want to know about your feeling of her as a character, her journey, what she went through. What is your reflection about her as a, as a character? Um, I'd say she, she's a complex character. Uh, I think a lot of girls go through the same thing. And I feel like maybe some people can relate to that. But that. did you feel her pain and her anguish and then at the end, her relief? Uh, yes, I did. Because okay. in certain ways, I do relate to the fact of, um, you know, that struggle with going overboard and wanting to be noticed by your peers. And, you know, I can definitely relate to that. Because that relief at the end of the film, to me, was what the whole story was was for. Like for us to go through that journey with her so that she can come out on the other side. And, you know, whenever a storyteller shares their experience, to me, that's the whole point of storytelling is to come out on the other side, a different person. And so if you watch the film and you went on this journey with her and you see that she came out a different person, then the storyteller reached her goal. Um, Agreed. I'd say Precious is just as much of a, um, like, you know, heart-wrenching movie without, you know, like, you know, the scene where she, they do depict, I feel like uh, the cinematographer could have um, right, but Precious is not about a Black Muslim girl from Senegal who moves to Paris. It's a different yeah, story. Yeah, it's a different story, but it does, uh, I'm saying with that, with that topic of specifically just the child exploitation, that, that, that's the only part. I'm not talking about the character or the story. I'm talking about- I'm just talking about what gave people such a very strong reaction to the movie. Yes. Um, and, and, and that's, that's, you know, that's, a, that's a very valid point. And that's what some people are going to take away that they just, you, you know, I've heard people say, like, even my daughter, and she's 18, you know, we got like 20 minutes in and she's just like, I'm done. I just don't want to see this. She just said, Mama, I just don't want to see this. I just don't want to see it. And she, I you know, say for um, so that's just some people have had that, you know, reaction. And that's, that's real. I, I, I oh yeah, I'm not knocking that. I, 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 I totally hand. agree on that. I had to hold my daughter's hand and we watched it together because of, I could see her, the, the visceral reaction she was having. And that might be powerful movie, um, mm -hmm. you know, telling your know, storytelling skills or whatever. But I, if you're, if that is the, what was the intention? Maybe that's, you know, we, we, and that would be great to talk to the, to the writer themselves, like what was their intention? Was their intention to have this effect on young women? Was was the intention to? And I hear somewhere that there was to bring highlight this. Uh, I felt like the the end came too quickly. Like it just was like she took a as a, as a writer, like it was a loose end, and then she tied it quickly together, and it was yeah. just. It was just too sudden. The the buildup was so long, and I feel like a lot of maybe this is an Eastern thing because uh, a lot of Eastern writers tend to do this. We dwell a lot on the beginning, the middle, the climax, and then the the end just is not right. powerful. Like it's not as strong as, or the effort is not put in to develop that character to that point where you're you you go away feeling like okay, she's gonna be okay. Like I, that scene was really cute with her jumping and jumping higher, higher, but there were just- That ending to me was the most powerful part of the film, but mm. it may not be that with somebody else. You know, right. everybody- I like the ending. I like that last frame. The frame Everybody's was beautiful. Everybody's takeaway is different. Yeah. But the frame, I, I thought the last frame when she was jumping rope was really beautiful and it was, um, uh, a, a good choice, definitely a good choice to show her innocence. Like, yes, yeah, she went through all of this, but she still has, still, she's an innocent child. She chose um, to be a kid. Right. However, I did feel like it, it did come too soon for from the day before, you know. But, 
you know, time, money, film costs money, and I understand <laughs> that. And um, movies are hard, man. Yeah. <laughs> and they are hard. <laughs> All right, alhamdulillah. We are going to be narrowing it down. We know it's Maghrib time and, and maybe even possibly chat and somewhere in the world. Um, I want to thank everyone for, for joining us tonight um, and, and, and taking time to reflect on this piece of art and this story that has caused such a ripple in the world, not just in um, the media, but in, in our communities and giving us something to reflect on, to dig into, to break down and to discuss and to, to see why it made us so com uncomfortable and to figure out where we as Muslims, as mothers, as daughters, as friends can do better because really that's what a story should do at the end of the day. And so when it comes to that part of opening up the conversation and, and, and giving some people something to feel and something to work on, I feel that she, she, hit her, she hit the nail on the mark. She gave us something to think about. She gave us something to talk about. And inshallah, she gave us something to aspire to do better at, right? To, to be better and to protecting our children and to do better in communicating in our marriages and communicating with our children and seeking help when we need help. Because that's something that we as women often have a problem with doing is saying, hey, I'm, I'm overworked, I'm overtired, I'm overparent, I'm overchild, I need help. Um, so I think that um, she did that. I think she did that. And I think she wrote a story that um, you know, it's going to be talked about for a very long time. Um, but we, as a Muslim community, community, I think that we have a responsibility to also do the work, right? To make sure that our narratives, the things that we want to see, right? We're saying that we want to see more joy and we want to see more everyday Muslim girls and boys who are just, you know, riding bikes or building buildings and owning stores. I see Sister Atiyah's in her store. Or shout out to Amatullah Treasures in Philadelphia. Make sure you check her out, inshallah. Um, do that. We, we have to support those stories. You know, we want to change the, the, the narrative that is being bought and sold by these powerful people. Then we have to support the other types of stories, right? We have all types of writers. We have all types of beautiful writers and producers and directors who are trying to get their stories out there, but we don't often have the support in the Muslim community to really get these stories to the front and center. So we have to do the work as well, inshallah. Um, so and I, I appreciate that, thank you. Because as an audience, we need to educate ourselves mm -hmm. because we sometimes we don't understand what goes on behind the scenes. It's not as simple as, oh, I wish they would make a show like that. It's really <laughs> not that easy. It's not that easy. Um, and, and the more that we know, the better yes. we can respond. You understand? So people are not just like, oh, it hit me upside the head. Why did they do that? They're not, they're trying to hurt me. I think also we've been so bullied and so beaten down by society, you know, non-Muslims that everything we do and we see about us, we, we get kind of you know, we have these reactions without really taking a step back and saying like, what is this story trying to say? So we have to do work on both sides, right? I appreciate that. I, I'm gonna share it like, um, uh, I had perhaps some of this is coming also from, from my end, it's coming from this too. And so um, you know, I work for a Muslim human rights organization. That's my day job, right? I work, uh, one of the things that we work for, proactively is stopping the Rohingya genocide. And um, a friend of mine is a, a consultant in Hollywood. She reached out to me. She's like, oh, um, there's, a, there's a, t a Hollywood TV show and they want to write the, the story about a Rohingya woman. So they called us, um, myself and my, uh, we have other team members. We sat down with them, we consulted with them. We told them, shared, you know, several hours of our time sh shared with them what the struggle is, what, what the genocide is, who the Rohingya people are. Every, the story they ended up coming out, ended up with was a Rohingya 
not a refugee, but a Rohingya immigrant student, which it, it would not happen because the Rohingyas have been kept uneducated for 20 years in, mm -hmm. their, um, in their country uh, under a system of apartheid, educational apartheid. So she's a Rohingya uh, immigrant student who's come here and then she uh, marries her English teacher and then she becomes, she is a lesbian and then she's, she kills her, the teacher or the, t or the girlfriend. I don't even remember exactly what and they ended up with, but it was so bizarre and out of the scope of reality. Their, their reality is already so, they're going through a genocide. What, mm. what more do you need to sell? Mm. This is at the crux of it. Again, I'm going to say the same thing. Our, our lived realities are so rich, so vibrant, so uh, at times, you know, uh, so horrendous because of the oppression that we are going through on a global scale, whether it's in Syria, in Mali, in Car Republic, and in, in, in the United States. In Baltimore. in Baltimore. Thank you. That's right. DC, <laughs> Atlanta, <laughs> California. Exactly. So, so. I don't know. It uh, we do you know so those that is where perhaps this this it's like it gets tiring, yeah. and that is Hollywood yeah. capitalism yeah. right there. Yeah. And if you want authentic stories about Muslims, you're gonna have to get it from Muslim creatives who create their own stories. As somebody who's been out here. 15 years trying to cooperate with people to tell authentic stories. They don't want that. Mm -hmm. They may want a little bit of semblance of that. That is never going to be a quote unquote Hollywood thing. Mm -hmm. So the people that are making Muslim centered stories that you should be giving your attention to are the Muslims who are actually out there doing it with their own money and fighting up against this um, quote unquote Hollywood machine because that's the reality. And I'm just saying that because I'm one of them. And I know several other black Muslim women who are creating things, who are struggling just like I am to make honest stories, but we don't have the backing. We don't have the support from our community either. So that's something that we need to talk about. Can you share about the film festival that you- Yes. So I created a Black Muslim Girl Fly Film Festival back in 2018 specifically because of that. And that way, the people who are actually making these Muslim-centered stories who don't get that representation can actually have a platform. So I've made connections with people in the industry just by being my Black Muslim self. That doesn't make it so that I get a job though. So like I've been at this for 15 years and I've never been employed by Hollywood, but I've networked and I've created and built these relationships because that's how things get done. And so because of those relationships, I was able to recruit several people like the producer who works at Pearl Street Films. Her name is Fanchon Cox. She works for Ben Affleck and, and Matt Damon. She's produced films. Um, Effie Brown, she's a black woman who's a producer. Um, she runs Game Changer. They, these are people who came on board to help us provide a platform for black Muslim women and black Muslim people who are making stories. They're judges, they're panelists on my film festival. And you can find out more if you go to filmfreeway.com backslash BMG Fly Fest. That stands for Black Muslim Girl Fly Best. I've already put it in the chat box. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Um, um, Javeri, would you like to um, end this? Inshallah? Yes, inshallah. Again, thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. This was a lively conversation. And hopefully, inshallah, we will have more conversations like this in our community because we need it, obviously. Um, thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Nia. Malika Dixon for this idea. Alhamdulillah, this really was her um, her brainchild. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah for you. Um, Alhamdulillah for you. Thank, you. thank you, Hina, for like, oh, I'm gonna watch the film. When I, I, hold on, I'm gonna watch the film. She's like, <laughs> don't count me out. I'm gonna watch the film, and she watched it. Alhamdulillah, and thank you to Hina Z for giving us this space with MuslimMatters.org to share our voices and share our thoughts and to come together. Alhamdulillah.
سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شر ولا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Have a good night everyone Good night وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته Mina you're so funny <laughs> you're a funny girl <laughs>